You're very welcome back to the show. Now, my next guest had an extremely successful career as a professional rugby player playing for his province and his country. But in 2010, this high-profile sports star opened up about his personal struggles with mental health and depression for the very first time in his autobiography, Red Blooded. Today, as an ambassador for a cycle against suicide, he's encouraging others to reach out to their bodies and let them know it's OK not to be OK. Alan Quinlan, you are so welcome to the show. Thank you so much for joining us. My pleasure, Elaine. How are you getting on in lockdown so far? Tell me. Ah, it's okay. I think it's uh, it's probably getting a bit tiresome now for for everybody. I think um, uh, it's it's not a great thing to say that we're getting. I'm getting used to kind of being a little bit idle and stuff like that. And I'm sure lots of people want to get back to work and and try and get back to some sort sort of normality. But um, it's difficult um, for for various different people in society and. Um, I suppose the only good saving grace, Elaine, is the weather has been good, thankfully. Yeah, I know, thank God, it has a bit of sunshine to cheer us all up. I have to say, I look at you and I just feel happy. As a Munster fan, I remember the glory days, the Heineken Cups, uh, all the, the major games. I mean, they were fantastic times to be a player, really, weren't they? And put on the red jersey. Yeah, they were. And I think in, in uh, because of um, sport has obviously been stopped uh, completely, that... In the last couple of weeks, we've seen lots of different games being replayed, and uh, I was very lucky to play with um, you know a great group of guys and uh, for a great team at that time. And uh, we won a couple of Heineken Cups and and other trophies and stuff, and it was very enjoyable. And uh, people often ask me, "What do I do? I miss it? Um, I miss the, my teammates. I miss the the buzz and the fun, and maybe." That walk from the dressing room out to the stadium, I think that was the kind of adrenaline rush that you get that you're going to battle and stuff like that. So it's, um, you miss it. But I, I, I look back with fond memories, mostly fond memories, some bad memories, of course. Um, we won't mention the Lions people. Tour, don't worry. We will not mention the Lions Tour. We leave that there yeah. for today. <laughs> but you mentioned that you do have fond memories. And I remember speaking to you before at an event and you were saying that you found when the, the professional rugby career, when you, it finished for you, that the, there was no, the, the, the bottom kind of dropped out here. Well, the camaraderie was gone. The, the people you could open up to was gone. And there's not a massive amount of, or at the time anyway, of professional help for sports people who suddenly have their whole, basically, life structure ripped away from them. Yeah, it's a complete change, Elaine. You know, when you're ingrained in something for so long, for 15 years for me and, and a lot of my teammates throughout that period were were there for a long time and... and We've heard lots of different sports people say that that void of the adrenaline rush, as I said, you know, playing in front of 80,000 people, the emotional roller coaster week after week, and, and the joy and happiness you get out of it as well. Um, it's it's kind of like it's addictive. You want to keep going forever, and uh, it's difficult for lots of sports people when that's, when that's gone and you're you're back with respect, you're back in the real world because it's 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 not something everybody experiences that opportunity and and to be that kind of lucky and, and uh, experience that kind of thing. But um, sometimes it's hard to replace that void. And, and I suppose you're, you're kind of like a robot. You're programmed in to go training, to watch your nutrition, to do all the fitness, play the match, and it just rolls on and on and on and on. And when that goes, it's, it's different. It yeah. takes a little bit of getting used to. I think probably for the first couple of months I certainly enjoy being able to relax and, and not have the pressure that goes with it but pressure stimulates us and it, it makes us go forward and stuff like that but um, I think it's it's very much linked to your health and well-being your mental health for sports people and a lot of sport ex-sports people have spoken about you know how they've got down and they've got depressed and and they've they found it difficult to to replace something like that so yeah. Really, the circumstances change physically and, and in front of you, but it's what's going on in your head, really, that you have to make those adjustments and and find peace and kind of happiness and ha and a purpose, I suppose. Yeah. you When you first, I suppose, came out about your, your depression and your mental health and your anxiety, it, it took a, a lot of people by surprise. And I think I can't even underestimate... Um, the, uh, the, the, I can never actually thank you for coming out the way you did because for a lot of people, myself included, I felt ashamed having something like depression and coping and no one would know we have the great, this great life, what are we to, to, to be depressed about? But for you, did you feel that sense of, of, sh of shame as well that you were going through something like this? That 
that you didn't weren't sharing with other people? Yeah, I, I look. I think um, there is a perception, and um, it's backed up by fact. I think St Patrick's Mental Health Hospital did a survey last year where. Uh, in the survey, they found that 60, 61% of people um, believe that somebody with a mental health problem um, is a sign of weakness, that that is weakness. So I think society is gradually changing over the years that we're trying to educate and make people understand. And, and individuals themselves, when they, when they hit a bit of a brick wall or have some sort of a, a roller coaster or some sort of trauma in their lives, that they can kind of reach out and speak about it. And it's, it's probably the best... Yeah way of de dealing with that so there was a sense of shame there was a sense of um i am showing weakness here that that i don't want to show and i don't want to show my vulnerabilities to people because you know i've i was an abrasive um aggressive rugby player in, in, a, in a fairly macho world that people look up to you and stuff like that so you're you're in a more difficult position and Sometimes that the sense is that, you know, the CEO of the company, the, the managing director, the captain of the team, the, the boss in, in, at work, they shouldn't be, uh, have an issue with their mental health because they're in a senior position. But that's, that's, uh, um, that's not the case because um, it can affect anyone at any stage. And it's really how you view the world yourself. And, and some, some people get angry and frustrated that they don't feel well in themselves, particularly when they don't know why. So there's lots of brilliant help out there now. And there's lots of, I think the most important thing, Elaine, for me is that um, the education and, and Cycle Against Suicide do a wonderful mm. job, as do many other charities in promoting and educating our, our, our next generation, the young kids who are certainly going to be the inspirers, who do lots of brilliant projects in school. They do lots of uh, awareness work around mental health and how they deal with each other. And I think that's that's a big shift in, in, in society, I think. And they'll make a really important um, step in reducing that stigma and taking away that fear. You mentioned the f shame, fear, uh, worry. How will people judge us? How will they view us and how will they look at us? And that's, that's the biggest fear for somebody. Um, sometimes there's lots of reasons and there's lots of transparent reasons why somebody... Is, is having a bad time. Their reality is not good and they're, they have every right to be depressed. Um, the, probably the, the most frustrating is when you're not really sure what's going on and why you're feeling unwell in yourself. So there's lots of different strands to, to this. Um, and I just think the most important thing is that people are more compassionate about somebody's story. They're compassionate, uh, they're, they show empathy about maybe a loved one, a friend, a colleague, someone they haven't checked in with. And uh, that's the whole reason of the, the Cycle Against Suicide buddy up and, and make that call campaign where you do check in with someone and, I, and you make a call and you ask them how they are and you listen maybe. And I get asked a lot, well, what kind of advice would you give if somebody presents with a mental health problem? And the best advice is to listen. Sometimes just to really zone in and listen to what they're saying and tell them it's going to be okay that yeah. you understand they're in pain or, or they're struggling and that makes a massive difference. Uh, but who do you have in your life who you can reach out to? Who's your buddy that you can call if you're having a bad day? Not, not anyone specific. I think some of my ex-teammates, um, I'm very close to them and we, we chat very regularly. Um, you don't get to see them as often because some of them are, are away. Ronald Gar in France, my friend guest in France. Um, some of my mates are in, in Limerick, Cork, all over the place, really, and the, the, the rugby players. And so I would chat to them fairly regularly, which is, is nice to catch up and see what they're doing. And then my, my close friends back in Tipperary. And um, so I have a, a really good circle of friends that I would regularly check in with and they with me as well. And sometimes you, it's not about it's just having a chat, really, a general conversation. And obviously, it's nice to know that there is people there that if I have a worry or a fear, that I can I can share that and yeah. sometimes we get a little bit of advice that that puts us back on track and, and that's important that's why the campaign is really good and you know I just think Elaine um, of rural Ireland for people who are a little bit isolated who are living in the countryside who don't have um, you know a big family to help and support them um, it could be a neighbor it could be someone that you might be best friends with, but it's just about checking in and offering them a little bit of help and support and seeing that they're okay, particularly during this crisis. I think that would be amazing.
Yeah, just even just making one call to someone you think that may need an ear can make all the difference. Yeah, I think it does. And it's just, it gives them an opportunity to maybe chat. And, and obviously you can pick up a little bit uh, by the tone of their voice if something's going on. And they might have some small issue um, that seems like a massive issue to them where you may be able to help and solve a problem for them. And it can just change that person's day and, and make life a little bit easier for them. And um, I think sometimes... Um, that yeah. that's really important to be able to listen to someone and, and, and I actually genuinely care as well. So I think the, the, the buddy up and make the call campaign is fantastic by Cycle Against Su Suicide. And it really is trying to encourage people just to check in on, on friends. You mightn't uh, have seen them in a while. Um, and that's normal. People yeah. kind of are very, very busy in their lives. But we all have friends that we we grew up with and someone that we could would come to mind that you think maybe, you know what, it'd be nice to just check in and see how they're doing, and that's really important. Speaking of buddies, are you missing your fellow pundits at Virgin Media? Because unfortunately, because of the way things are, matches got cancelled, everything is all, every match, every, all the rugby games are, are, God knows when we'll have another one again. Are you, are you missing your, your Virgin work buddies? <laughs> uh, I am, I am surely, um, definitely, Elaine. I'm, I'm missing the sport, it's massive. Um, I love all sports, not just the rugby. I'm, I'm lo very lucky to be able to work in rugby now, and but I miss all the sports and um, hopefully we will be back in Virgin Media soon covering the, the European Games first, um, the conclusion, quarterfinals, semifinals, finals there of the European Cup and then uh, the resumption of the Six Nations, the last two games against Italy and France for Ireland. So I really hope we can get back soon. But look, it's, it's, it's at a stage now where nobody's really sure. There is a bit of a roadmap there. So hopefully that roadmap can be moved forward a little bit and... Um, but I do miss it, and I, I, I'm sure lots of people miss it. You know, even yeah. even the opportunity to bring my son to training on, on Saturday mornings in his school, I coach him there, my son AJ, and, and just bringing him there at eight or nine o'clock on a Saturday morning when, I, when I'm around to be able to do that, um, I really, really miss that because I think exercise is, is a brilliant part of mental health yeah. as well. It's a great way of helping people, you know, release a bit of energy and a bit of anxiety. And uh, it's really good for all our kids and, and for adults as well. So yeah. hopefully sport <laughs> can come back pretty soon. But uh, well, we'll Fingers and toes see. and everything else crossed. So we'll, we'll, we'll all return to some sort of normality soon. Listen, Alan, thank you so much for taking the time out to chat to us today. It's been an absolute pleasure. Thank you, Elaine. Now we'll take a quick break. Catch us back here in three.